Let us worship God. Let us seek God's face together by singing from Psalm 68, and we'll sing verses 16 to 20. The tune is Sheffield, which is number 130. Psalm 68, verses 16 to 20. Verse 18, we sing, Thou hast, O Lord, most glorious, ascended up on high, and in triumph victorious led captive captivity. Thou hast received gifts for men, for such as did rebel. Yea, even for them, that God the Lord in midst of them might dwell. Let's sing to God's praise, verses 16 to 20. God's face together in prayer. Our great God and Savior, we come again this afternoon asking that you would draw us as we seek to press into the veil. Grant unto us, O Lord, that grace which takes the cares and burdens of our hearts and casts them upon you, laying aside uh, that which would otherwise occupy and preoccupy our thoughts. And instead, we ask, O Lord, that we would be spiritually minded, which is life, and that we would set aside all else in order to fix our hearts and our concentration upon you, the Most High God, our great and glorious Savior. You, O Lord, are uh, that living fountain 
which brings to us every blessing, an inexhaustible fountain, a fountain which brings abundant grace into our sin-cursed and needy souls. We are thankful that you are altogether all-sufficient uh, for all that your people stand in need of. Uh, you do not leave us uh, lacking any good thing. You don't, do not leave us to, to fetch from another source that which we lack. We find in you a fountain of living waters, that river which flows from the throne into the city of God, which refreshes the people of God and makes us strong in your ways and in your word. And so we, we bring ourselves under your throne again. Uh, we bring ourselves self-consciously acknowledging uh, that you alone are God, that you are full of glory and might and power. And we ask that you would give us, O oh Lord, that, that privilege of, of wrestling with you in prayer as Jacob did, uh, refusing to let you go and uh, being able to secure the blessing. And we see, O oh Lord, uh, your grace in both resisting uh, Jacob and drawing him, giving him uh, in, in, that, uh, in that match to be sent away blessed. So we ask, O oh Lord, that our souls would labor under the means of grace and in the things of, of your grace, and that you would draw and send us away with blessing. Make our hearts glad in the things of God. Cause us to rejoice in our Savior. Cause us, O oh Lord, to magnify him as Lord and King. We would have no other. We, left to ourselves, would be content to enthrone ourselves as a Lord, uh, to serve ourselves, uh, to determine our own course and destiny, to set our own standards of right and wrong, to pursue our own glory. But you, O oh Lord, have delivered us from this vexation, this rebellion, and this self-destruction. And you have brought us and made us servants of the Most High God. And give us, O oh Lord, grace then uh, to serve while it is day. Give us grace to seek the, the place of chief, chief servant, uh, which is in your eyes to be prized, the greatest in the kingdom to seek rather to be a doorkeeper in your house than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. Grant, O Lord, that we would offer our bodies to you as well as our souls as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto you. Enable us to uh, seize this day, to harness the time that has been allotted to us and to then invest and employ it uh, extensively in our uh, seeking first your kingdom and your righteousness. O oh Lord, our time is brief. We are, as we have often uh, cried out, admitting we are, a, we are a vapor. We have so little time and yet so much work that lies before us. Uh, give us strength and uphold and sustain us, each of us as Christians, uh, employing gifts and grace, and all the resources that we have been furnished with, employing them all in the advance of your own uh, kingdom. We come, O Lord, acknowledging our, our many sins. Lord, it is easy for us uh, to see our sin, and yet it is difficult for us to, to really search out our own hearts. We are content with uh, the superficial expressions of contrition and of repentance, and are unwilling to undergo that the painful task of, of digging up and slaying, mortifying, uh, repenting, and abandoning uh, the secret sins of our heart and mind. We are quick to excuse. We are quick to justify. Uh, we are quick to, mini to minimize uh, those faults which we would be inclined to defend. Uh, we are a people who in all of this, demonstrate our, our folly. And we would not have it so, Lord. We would own and face and confess and repent 
over our many sins. So search us and know us and see if there be any wicked way in us and lead us in the way everlasting. And deliver us, O Lord, from uh, those strengths that we lean upon, often uh, idolizing and certainly employing in sin. Help us, O Lord, to repent and to give, uh, to give up these things unto you. We acknowledge, O Lord, that your all-seeing eye is not fooled like our own sinful, short-sighted eye. You see us to the very depths of our being. And so we, we acknowledge our waywardness, our darkness, our pollution and f- filth, and ask, O God, have mercy upon us for Jesus' sake. And we are thankful that just as you thoroughly search us out, you thoroughly forgive. And for those who come with genuine faith and repentance in Christ, where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. We thank you for that abounding grace, uh, even to the chief of sinners. And we ask that you would magnify your glory in that grace that you would get glory for yourself through the vessels of mercy. May it, be so, may it be so, O Lord. Magnify, we pray, your own holy name. For you are the potter and we are the clay and we place ourselves in your hand to do according to your own will and after your own good pleasure. And we plead as well, O Lord, for uh, the families that are represented in this congregation We desire, like Abraham, to be presented with our children before you, commanding our children after you, uh, instructing and teaching them, raising them in the fear and admonition of the Lord, diligently teaching them as we go in the way, as we lie down, as we rise up. But unless you, O Lord, be building the house, we do labor in vain who build it. And our our feebles, our, our, our labors are feeble at best. They are weak and inconsistent and often uh, broken and much left undone. We pray, O Lord, that you would not give to us according to our deserts, but that you would give to us according to your grace, that you would bless these feeble efforts that take place painstakingly often within the home, day in and day out. Own them. Be pleased to add your divine benediction to them. Sanctify and make them fruitful for your glory. We ask, O Lord, that you would seek uh, the lost sheep, that one who goes astray. You are the God who leaves the ninety and nine to pursue the one that is lost and in bringing home that one uh, to rejoice uh, as the angels themselves in heaven rejoice over the recovery and repentance of one sinner. So, Lord, work accordingly in our own midst and in uh, our own circumstances. We plead as well that you would uh, take the gospel and that you would set it as it were before the wind, that it would be taken with power and uh, forcefulness before a a great gale into the hearts and minds of, of those in our own community and throughout our country and in distant places throughout the earth. Uh, The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. And grant, Lord, that that power would continue to be manifest in the salvation of your elect people. We plead, O Lord, that you would uh, take the word of God, which we sing this day, which we read, which we reflect and meditate upon, which we hear preached, uh, grant that all of this would be uh, brought home to our, our souls to nourish us, to feed us, Uh, to impart strength, spiritual strength, Uh, overthrow that which is erroneous in our minds, tear down falsehoods, establish us in the truth, cause us to be built up in in that holy faith. Uh, Grant, O Lord, that you would uh, press us into the mold of Holy Scripture, that we would not continue in our own way of thinking and speaking and acting, but that we would be made more and more by the Spirit into the likeness of your beloved Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus. May his stamp be found upon us and his image uh, be recreated by grace uh, within us. Uh, We seek these things, O Lord, at your hand, knowing that you alone can give according to our heart's desire. 
And we pray that you would give us our daily bread, our temporal necessities, that you would show yourself to be the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, a God who can say that the fullness of all of the earth uh, belongs unto you, the Lord. And so give out of your bounty uh, to your people. And we ask that you would uh, bless us now in our, our ongoing uh, work of worship. Uh, draw nigh to us, O Lord, in all that we're about. And we ask that these things would not pass unimproved, but that as hearers we would also be doers. And like that one who built his house upon the rock, that we would, by your grace, stand in an evil day and in the storms of this world. And so we commit ourselves to you and pray, O Lord, look upon us with mercy. Grant us a sense, a manifestation of your presence among us, and do us good, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I ask you to turn back with me to Psalm 109. We will pick up where we left off this morning. Having reached the last section of Psalm 109, we'll sing those verses found in verses 28 to 31. And the tune is Nodding Hill, which is number 94 to 94. Psalm 109, verse 28 to the end. And notice that this psalm of, of imprecation ends with these words, For he shall stand at his right hand who is in poverty to save him from all those that would condemn his soul to die. Verses 28 to 31. Old Testament reading is found in Joshua chapter 13. So let's turn together in the Holy Scriptures to the Old Testament book of Joshua as we read together from chapter 13. Let's please give careful heed and reverent hearing to the reading of God's holy word. Now Joshua was old and stricken in years. And the Lord said unto him, Thou art old and stricken in years, and there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. This is the land that yet remaineth. 
all the borders of the Philistines, and all Geshuri, from Sihor, which is before Egypt, even unto the borders of Ekra northward, which is counted to the Canaanite, five lords of the Philistines, the Gazathites and the Ashdothites, the Eshkelonites, the Gittites, and the Ekronites, also the Avites. From the south, all, all the land of the Canaanites and Marara, that is beside the Sidonians, unto Aphek, to the borders of the Amorites, and the land of the Giblites, and all Lebanon toward the sun rising, from Baal Gad under Mount Hermon, unto the entering into Hamath, all the inhabitants of the hill country from Lebanon, unto Misrephoth Maim, and all the Sidonians, them will I drive out from before the children of Israel. Only divide thou it by lot unto the Israelites for an inheritance, as I have commanded thee. Now therefore divide this land for an inheritance unto the nine tribes and the half-tribe of Manasseh, with whom the Reubenites and the Gadites have received their inheritance, which Moses gave them beyond Jordan eastward even as Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave them from Aror, that is, upon the bank of the river Arnon, and the city that is in the midst of the river, and all the plain of Mediba unto Dibon, and all the cities of Sion, king of the Amorites, which reigned in Heshbon, unto the border of the children of Ammon, and Gilead, and the border of the Geshurites, and Maacathites, and all Mount Hermon, and all Bashan, unto Salka, all the kingdom of Og in Bashan, which reigned in Ashtaroth and in Edrei, who remained of the remnant of the giants. For these did Moses smite and cast them out. Nevertheless, the children of Israel expelled not the Geshurites nor the Maacathites, but the Geshurites and the Maacathites dwell among the Israelites until this day. Only unto the tribe of Levi he gave none inheritance. The sacrifices of the Lord God of Israel made by fire are their inheritance, as he said unto them. And Moses gave unto the tribe of the children of Reuben inheritance according to their families, and their coast was from a roar that is on the, the bank of the river Arnon, and the city that is in the midst of the river, and all the plain of Mediba, Heshbon, and all the, her cities that are in the plain, Dibon, and uh, Bamoth Baal, and Beth Baal Meon, and Jehaza, and Kedemoth, and Mephaath, and Kerjathaim, and Zibma, and Jarath Shehar in the mount of the valley, and Beth Peor, and Ash doth Pisgah, and Beth Shemimoth, and all the cities of the plain, and all the kingdom of Sion, king of the Amorites, which reigned in Heshbon, whom Moses smote with the princes of Midian, Evi, and Rechem, and Zur, and Hur, and Reba, which were dukes of Sion, dwelling in the country. Balaam also, the son of Beor, the soothsayer, did the children of Israel slay with the sword among them that were slain by them. And the border of the children of Reuben was Jordan, and the border thereof. This was the inheritance of the children of Reuben after their families, the cities, and the villages thereof. And Moses gave inheritance unto the tribe of Gad, even unto the children of Gad, according to their families. And their coast was Jazer, and all the cities of Gilead, and half the land of the children of Ammon, unto Aror, that is before Rabbah, and from Heshbon, unto Ramath Mizpah, and Betonem, and from Mehenaim, unto the border of Deber, and in the valley, Beth Aram, and Beth Nimrah, and Sukoth, and Zaphon, the rest of the kingdom of Zion, king of Heshbon, 
Jordan and his border, even unto the edge of the sea of Kenareth, on the other side, Jordan eastward. This is the inheritance of the children of Gad after their families, the cities and their villages. And Moses gave inheritance unto half, uh, the half-tribe of Manasseh. And this was the possession of the half of the half tribe of the children of Manasseh by their families. And their coast was from May Hanaim, uh, all Bashan, all the kingdom of Og, king of Bashan, and all the towns of Jair, which are in Bashan, three score cities, and half Gilead, and Ashtaroth, Adriai, cities of the kingdom of Og in Bashan, were pertaining unto the children of Machir. Uh, the son of Manasseh, even to the one half of the tribe of Machir by their families. These are the uh, countries which Moses did distribute for inheritance in the plains of Moab on the other side Jordan by Jericho eastward. And unto the tribe of Levi, Moses gave not any inheritance. The Lord God of Israel was their inheritance, as he said unto them. And may God bless this portion of his inspired and inerrant and infallible word. To his name be the praise. Let's seek God's face again by singing together from Psalm 110. Psalm 110, we'll sing the whole psalm to the tune Strakathro, uh, the tune Strakathro, which is tune number one. 36, tune 136. Psalm 110, as many of you will know, including probably most of the children, is the most frequently quoted psalm in the New Testament, the psalm being the most frequently quoted book in the New Testament, understandably, because it is a permanent manual of praise for God's people. And in Psalm 110, we have, uh, we, we sing about the Lord Jesus both as a king and as a priest. He is the great king who sits as Lord at the right hand of the majesty on high, where he reigns even now as we sing, uh, and will reign until all of his enemies are made his footstool. So it's a picture of a victorious and triumphant king subduing uh, all of his enemies as a governor. But he's also a priest after the order of Melchizedek, which the author to the Hebrews uh, speaks about extensively and one who is able to provide for us abundantly as such. In verse 5, the glorious and mighty Lord that sits at thy right hand shall in his day of wrath strike through kings that do him withstand. And then it goes on to, to speak of the various descriptions of that triumph. But for us, he says in verse 3, a willing people in thy day of power shall come to thee in holy beauties from morn Morn's womb, thy youth like dew shall be. So let's sing to our glorious King and Priest, our Savior, the Lord Jesus, uh, Psalm 110 to the tune Stracathro.
turn again in the reading of God's Word, this time to the New Testament book of Ephesians. We'll be reading from Ephesians 1. It wasn't that long ago that we had this portion for uh, our reading on another occasion, but this afternoon I would especially draw your attention to the theme of inheritance that, along with the doctrine of election, is so prevalent in this particular chapter. It's for that reason that we read it together. Ephesians chapter 1, and let us worship God then in the reading of his word. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, being predestinated, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory." Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Amen. Let's turn now in the Holy Scriptures back to our first reading found in Joshua chapter 13. We continue our series of sermons through the book of Joshua, and we come to this portion this afternoon, book of Joshua chapter 13. It begins with verse 1 like this, Now Joshua was old and stricken in years, And the Lord said unto him, Thou art old and stricken in years, and there remaineth yet much land to be possessed. Several of you have taken the trip 
up to the Presbytery's annual family conference. Uh, For our family, that takes us out the top of South Carolina into Asheville and the northward uh, through a portion of western North Carolina, a corner of northeast Tennessee, into southwest Virginia, and ultimately up into the Shenandoah Valley, uh, near where we pull off to go to the conference. And that trip is, uh, for our family, something like a trip through both personal and familial history. Uh, My wife and I began uh, our marriage by going on our honeymoon to the mountains of of Western North Carolina. Uh, My family on my mom's side uh, go back in those counties uh, 200 years. And so as we're driving through uh, Western North Carolina, I can, you know, we come to Yancey County and I say, well, uh, this is the county with six of the highest peaks east, east of the Mississippi, including the highest one, Mount Mitchell. And these are where my people have been for a long, long time. Uh, we pass the exit where my grandmother was born. Uh, and I can go on and on speaking about lots of details as we go. Up over Sam's Gap, down into Johnson City, I can point you to a, the back of a building. We're now into the territory of my first pastorate and say, see the back of that building? It's a used bookstore. And these are the following gems in my library that I've culled from that place. Here's an exit where an elder, uh, my first elder lived. Here's where we lived when we had one child. Here's the hospital that my third born was born in. And you just goes on and on and on. Do you see that little town over there? Do you see the steeple in the middle? I've preached there a dozen times, and I've preached at this place. And on and on it goes as we, we drive through uh, on our way to the conference. There's both lots of personal history for us as a family and in terms of our, our ancient ties, if you will, our, our own um, extended family's history as well. Now, in the midst of all of that, there have been occasions when uh, I have been transporting a Scottish minister, one of our guest speakers, with us up to the conference. And I have refrained from um, rehearsing this myriad of details, literally almost seems like exit by exit, I could speak to. Why? Because if I were to plunge into that, their eyes would glaze over and they would descend into profound boredom, listening to me rant about people they do not know and places they do not care about. Now, I don't spare my own children, but I do spare the, 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 the ministers that, uh, that travel with us. And you can see something of the relevance of this when you think about the text that is before us. We read through this passage, and there are dozens of places which are described and people that are described. And there's a temptation, perhaps, for some of us Uh, to struggle. We don't find this as engaging. We don't find this as riveting as perhaps some of the previous passages describing uh, the conquering of the land and the warfare and so on. But for the Israelite people, these words, these ancient Hebrew names, would have invoked great warmth. It would have blessed their souls to speak about, to, to speak the names of these places and to recount what God had done with their people in the places that are being highlighted here. Just as it warms my heart, and I love the trip to the conference for uh, the same sorts of reasons. We need to keep that in mind. This, after all, is our history as we're often remembered. Joshua 13 is describing our people. It's describing things that have taken place for us in uh, these places, and the names um, should, many of them, stick with us as an important part of our heritage. And in fact, I find, you know, the, the Hebrew names are themselves very engaging. I mean, the, it's a foreign sound, but um, Hebrew is, uh, is a language, as someone has said, that is very vertical. Uh, the words in Hebrew go down deep, and they rise high. And there's, there's something very striking even about the sounds of, of the words, even when we struggle to, to pronounce them. They ought, to be, 
they ought to be um, impressed upon our hearts and minds as we see. And certainly, though we're tempted at times to, to not appreciate to the extent we ought, uh, many of the descriptions that we find here for the Israelite people it would have thrilled their hearts. This was very personal, very enlivening, very warm uh, history for them. As we come to chapter 13, uh, we're actually entering another division of the book. We're coming to another section of the book of Joshua, which will take us from here in chapter 13 through chapter 21. And this section of the book speaks about possession of the land. There was the conquering that is now followed by the possessing of the land. And we must not approach this in a sense of being detached. Here they are. The land is being distributed to the Israelites, and they're prizing it. It's an inheritance, and that's our theme for this afternoon, obtaining an inheritance. Let's look at three things. First of all, a promised inheritance in verses 1 to 7. A promised inheritance. Uh, Another way of thinking of this particular passage is like that of reading a will. If you're listening to a will being read by someone you don't know and speaking about property that you don't know, it's of little interest. But if you are the one sitting, and if the will is actually your bequest, your, what you are inheriting, every word is going to be meaningful to you. All of this is being described of what you receive, have inherited, and has been given to you, gifted uh, to you. And that is never dull. Here we have them describing this inheritance. But it begins in verse 1 with a reference to Joshua. Joshua was old and stricken in years. That's a description of fact. Then God actually tells Joshua, goes on to say, Thou art old and stricken in years, and there remaineth yet very much land to be uh, possessed. Joshua is old. Uh, It's interesting that the promises given in chapter 1 come at the end of Moses' life. And now we have here promises being given about the future at the conclusion of Joshua's life, when he is now old. It's a good reminder both to Joshua and to us. He's old. And the fact is, only he and Caleb could be called old and stricken in years. Because everyone that was 20 years and above, their carcasses were left in the wilderness. And so Joshua and Caleb are two of the few, well, two of the only really gray-headed ancient men among the people of, of Israel. Joshua was a man of war from his youth and was such even at the time of Mount Sinai. But now he's, he's old, he's stricken of age. He's facing the reality of the infirmities of age. Just like everyone, no matter how stout and strong a person may be, everyone is brought to face the infirmities of old age. Ecclesiastes has a very graphic way of putting this point to us toward the end of, of that book. And so we're to remember, when we get old, we ought to remember, not ignore, the fact that we're old. Young people want to pretend or act as if they're way older. Old people, shamefully at times, want to pretend or act as if they're far younger. But God says to the youth, remember your young. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Flee youthful lusts. You're young, and there are, there are exhortations that belong to you. Don't ignore the fact that you're young and, theref- and thereby fail to profit from the things that are relevant for you. Likewise, you're old. When you're old, remember that you're old. Rather than ignoring it or denying it, you're to improve it. You're to bring forth the fruit of wisdom that comes with uh, ancient age. You are to remember the words of Psalm 90, for example, when it speaks of the Lord's blessing that uh, comes upon those who are 
in advanced years. In fact, the Psalms give us such instruction on a number of occasions, pointedly addressing those who are advanced in years. And so here is Joshua. You're old and stricken in years. A lot needs to still be possessed. God's bringing to his mind, making him face the reality of his circumstances. We don't need to press this at great length, but for those who have and are reaching uh, the older years, we need to heed these things. What is required of us as we near the end, as we near the great divide, there's an increase of urgency to put things in order. We want to run to the end, through the finish, not to come slack on the last leg of the race and to sit down on the side, but to press through, as it were, to the finish, to complete the race. Paul can say, I have fought the the fight. I have finished the race. And so there needs to be an urgency in that sense. There needs to be an urgency in terms of putting our life, body, and soul in order, lest death come and sweep us away before we see it, before we see its shadow overtaking us. There needs to be a sober sense of preparing for eternity and preparing those around us uh, for the same, prioritizing the improvement of the years that remain. Well, here is the Lord giving a sufficient promise. You see the need. There's still a land that need, there's still a lot of land that needs to be possessed. But look at verse six. He says, "Then will I drive out from before the children of Israel, only divide it by lot unto Israel for an inheritance, as I have commanded thee." The Lord says, "I, I will drive it. I will drive them out before the children of Israel." This is a sufficient promise, a promised inheritance. Much land needs to be occupied in the days ahead, but God's power is adequate to bring it to pass. All you need to do, Joshua, is to set out the allotments, draw the property lines, and give them the allotments, the land to the tribes, I will. I will bring about this, the subjection of those who remain and the conquering of the land. Though much land remains, verse 1, they should also not forget all that has been accomplished under Joshua. You look at verses 2 through the beginning of verse 4, the southwest. You look at verses 4 through verse 6a, the north, almost 50 miles north of Damascus. I mean, there is a significant dominance that's taken place. So while pointing out there's still a lot that has to be possessed, let us not minimize all that God has indeed already accomplished for his people. The Lord has created a vacuum that he intends Israel to fill through the removal of the Canaanites and the conquering of those who have been uh, destroyed. It's God's power, verse 6. It is God's power. The promise belongs to the Lord. And the promises of the Lord can amaze us, and in fact, if we hear them properly, should amaze us. I mean, God says to, says to Abraham, I'm going to give this massive land to your seed. You know, walk, walk through it. Take a look. This is what's, what's going to belong to your seed. Abraham's thinking, I've come from Ur of the Chaldees. This land is too good to be true, lush, and absolutely wonderful. But look at all the giants and the, the mass of, of people that are here. How will this ever happen? The Lord says it'll happen. And it indeed did happen. The Lord's promise, though it may stretch our feeble faith, the scope is to be measured by God's will, not by our imagination, not by what we, humanly speaking, deem likely. And to be honest, that's a great blessing to me. I don't have to look and say, here's what is humanly attainable within reason. That would shrink everything, wouldn't it? But instead we come and say, God hath said. God has promised this and that. And though it it seems so far-fetched, so difficult for us to believe, we will believe. Lord, help us in our unbelief to take confidence in great promises 
which astound us to even imagine. And so here's the the mortality of one of God's servants, Joshua. That doesn't handicap the everlasting God. Joshua's going to die. God is going to carry forward his own work. Joshua had entered Moses' labors, and now others will enter into Joshua's labors as he goes uh, to heaven, leaving this world. And so we're to take comfort in what we have, though we don't have all that we would. We're to take comfort in what we have, and we're to believe all that God has promised. So let's bring this down uh, to our own uh, circumstances. In Ephesians 1, the Lord says, I am giving you an eternal inheritance. We say, sure, we know, we've heard. No, you, you haven't, you've heard, but you haven't comprehended. Now, I'm not going to hijack the sermon and preach an entire sermon on the nature of this inheritance. You look for yourself. If you begin to take in, to take on board all that the Bible has described about your eternal inheritance, Christian, it is astounding. It is absolutely mind-boggling. It is difficult for us to grasp, much less believe. And the Lord says, now listen, let's start with where you are right now. I've given you a down payment, he says in Ephesians 1. I've given you an earnest of your inheritance. That is a guarantee to you of all that is to follow. All that is to follow is the eternal inheritance I've provided and prepared for you. And so we, are, we rejoice. We have the Holy Spirit now. And we rejoice in that blessing. We're not, we're not uh, minimizing that. But we also look forward with faith to what's difficult for us to even begin to imagine that he has provided for us in this world and especially ultimately in uh, the world to come, the new heavens and in the new earth. There's a promised inheritance Secondly, there is a threatened inheritance, verses 8 to 13, a threatened inheritance. As always, we have promise coupled with warning. We have blessing coupled with curse. This is God's way. We know it well in our acquaintance with Holy Scripture. In verse 13, it says, Nevertheless, the children of Israel expelled not the Geshurites, nor the Maacathites, but the Geshurites and the Maacathites dwell among the Israelites until this day. Here we have the first sign of waning vigilance. This is the first little precursor of waning vigilance. There is going to be much, much more on this score in chapters 15, 16, and 17 and as we saw years ago in Judges chapter 1. But it begins here. This is the first portion, the first place where it's really highlighted in the, the, the passages that we've been looking at here recently. It is necessary for them not only to start well, but to finish well. Not only to invade the land, but to persevere in possessing the, the land. Both have to be the case. In one sense, this is picking up on the theme we talked about this morning. There has to be a perseverance. There has to be spiritual follow-through. There has to be an incessant pursuit for the Christian, not only to begin well, but to, to finish well. It's interesting that I was speaking with a number of children, all of whom were five or under, I think, at lunch, about this morning's sermon asking them what they heard and understood and so on. And three of them gave me three beautiful illustrations, all their own, that were underlining the, the point of perseverance this morning. You know, one spoke about how, you know, we're fighting a lion and the devil is like a lion. And if we stop fighting, we would be killed and we have to resist the lion. Spot on. That's, in fact, what the Bible itself, an illustration in the Bible itself says. Another one said, I had a wooden shield and I left it outside in the rain for a while, and it rotted and is of no use anymore. God gives us a shield, shield of faith, with which to quench the fiery darts. If we dispose of it, it's going to 
uh, it's going to fall apart, and so on. Right? These are the kinds of points that we're seeing highlighted here as well. They need to not only start, they need to persevere and, and see it through. Incomplete obedience does not bring an immediate crisis to our life often. An incomplete obedience does not instantly bring a crisis. Sometimes it does, but often it doesn't. And we can be faithful in the midst of a crisis, amidst all of the excitement even of the assaults that are coming down upon us. We're aroused to some vigilance. But we lack tenacity. We lack endurance. And we do not have faith in the little things. You can see how a person's kind of roused to do great feats. But in the, the common the mundane things. It's easy to have little zeal. And he's saying, there's a threat here. There's a threat. And where exactly does the threat lie? They are not being restricted by God's promises. No, much to the contrary. The restriction doesn't come with God's promises. The restriction comes with their own unbelief and consequent disobedience. And this is the point that Hebrews brings out so saliently. The restriction is in their unbelief and in their disobedience. He's saying you must continue to possess the land. The Christian is told, listen, you do not get to exchange your armor for a robe until you die. You do not get to take the helmet off and put the crown on until you die. Until you die, you sleep, you eat, you drink, you live in your armor. The robes, the white robes, the crown, all of that comes to the church triumphant. The church militant, the church in this world lives in our armor. We are to fight sin, fight Satan, fight our sinful selves all life long. But here we have the promise of God yet. It is God that will tread down our enemies. Just as he did with the Exodus, throwing, casting the horse and the rider into the sea and drowning Pharaoh and all of his host. God is the one who will tread down our enemies. Christ is king. Thanks be to his glorious name. He will subdue all of his and our enemies to his own glory. The threat is not in him nor in his promise, but we must believe and we must, by God's grace, obey in working out our salvation with godly fear, knowing that it is he that works in us to will and do of his own good pleasure. Thirdly, we see a confirmed inheritance in verses 14 to the end. Verses 14 to the end, a confirmed inheritance. Now we have the details. The inheritance of Reuben, the inheritance of Gad, the inheritance of half the tribe of Manasseh, spelled out in detail for us. Notice um, that all things are not held in common, But there are allotments given, broken down into families, and the inheritance, the property is given to them, kept by them, and passed down from generation to generation to generation to generation. And it it reminds us that this whole idea of, of property rights is in fact a biblical imperative. It is rooted in the moral law of God, the Eighth Commandment. There is a biblical basis for the idea of private uh, property and the rights that belong to those who are given it as stewards under, under God. You see that coming out even in places like this. So here's Reuben. Reuben is in the deep south. Reuben occupies the deep south, the river Arnon to Heshbon. Gad is in the middle from Heshbon to Mahanaim uh, near the river Jabok. These are prominent things that you can find on the map. And then half the tribe of Manasseh is in the north, all, including all of the land of, of Bashan. And so 
What we're seeing here is God's goodness. You know, we can think about America. You have the breadbasket in the, the Midwest. You have the mountains. You have the lakes. You have the rivers. You have, you know, these various portions of, of the country. Well, this is the kind, these are the kind of pictures that come to mind. Here is God's goodness. And you'll remember last week, the main theme was highlighting, reiterating, and thanking God particularly for all of the expressions of his goodness. And so he's saying, do you see the bounty that God's given to his people? Let this reinforce your allegiance to him, to Jehovah. Don't you dare make a league with those who are the enemy of God. Make sure that you keep fighting to possess what God has in fact given you. He's given it to you by allotment. You are to ensure that you persevere in possessing this. You must go from promise to possession. Promise to possession is essential. And so there's all of the, the language, all of these different places that are given. Mount Pisgah, this is where Moses stood to look over into the land of promise before he died. It's where Elijah left this world in his, his chariot. You have the land of Gilead, known for its balm, the balm of Gilead, and the fruitfulness of that. This is, you have the territory that Gideon occupied and came from. You have the, the place where rebellious Absalom was, was beaten. Uh, you have, in, in verse 26, you have that, that portion of Sharon, which is known for its uh, fragrant and, and lush uh, roses. It includes that portion of Sharon. You have the portion of the Gadarenes, who love their swine, as we see in the, the New Testament. You have Bashan, known for its fantastic oaks, the oaks of Bashan, or its, its breed of bulls, the beef, the bulls of Bashan. This is the portion, you know, this area where Jephthah, we find him running around, and Elijah uh, hails from, and so on. This is lush, this is bountiful, this is the goodness of God. And there is the repeated allusions to victories. Sion, as we saw last week, Og, even Balaam is mentioned in this chapter. The soothsayer, cut down, destroyed as one of the enemies of God by the, the people of God. So that all of this geographical description, all of the topography that is being highlighted, they could march around it. And it would enable them to call to memory all that God had done for them. There were physical, visible displays of the great works of God, all of which shouted about the victories that God had, had done. He's saying, these things need to be kept in your memory. This confirmed inheritance, look at the bounty of the land, look at the history in bringing it to you, keep these in your memory. Why? To fortify your faith. To strengthen and increase your faith. Confidence in the promised inheritance that God has given to you. Notice the reference to, to the Levites twice in this section. The Levites are given no land allotment. They're not given such an inheritance. What's their inheritance? Verse 14 tells us, first of all, only unto the tribe of Levi gave, uh, he gave none inheritance. The sacrifices of the Lord God of Israel made by fire are their inheritance. As he said unto them, they lived off of the public ministry of the Old Testament church. And you see this all through the book of Leviticus and Numbers and elsewhere. They bring the offerings, a portion of which are given to the, the Levites to sustain them. But they have no. The, the Levites are taken and they're spread through the whole land. And they are found in pockets where they're able to preach and where they're able to instruct and, and to be spiritual guides sprinkled throughout the land amongst uh, the people. And they live off of these offerings. But no, no real estate that is uh, their own in that circumstance. They're living off of the offerings. Now remember, the offerings belong to God. The offerings belong to God. God takes what is his 
and then imparts it to uh, the Levites. But then their inheritance is described even more beautifully at the end of the chapter when it says, Under the tribe of Levi, Moses gave not an inheritance, the Lord, God of Israel, was their inheritance. What were they given? God himself. They were given God himself. This trumps all else. And there's a sense in which the believing people of Israel could all share in a measure with Levi in that inheritance. To have Jehovah as their God, as their portion, as it, the word is sometimes translated, to have Jehovah as their portion. And in fact, we see here, this is the true inheritance, is it not? This is the true inheritance, having the Lord. The land was a type. It was a picture. It was a symbol. It was a shadow to point to something otherworldly, heavenly, permanent, more beautiful, something far greater than their piece of real estate that they could kick dirt up on, plant flowers in, and so on. The Lord is the inheritance. And we see this coming out over and over in the Psalms, for example. This is worked, massaged down into our very souls. Psalm 142, verse 5, I cried unto thee, O Lord, I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. This is every Israelite, Old Testament, New Testament, in the past, in the present, we are taught to sing, Lord, you are my portion, my inheritance in the land of the living. God is our portion. And it would be fruitful for you to pursue this theme through the whole book of Psalms. Psalm 73, verse 20. It says, As a dream when one waketh, O Lord, when thou wakest, thou shalt uh, despise their image. Excuse me. Uh, Psalm 73, verse um, 26. I'm sorry. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. God is my portion forever. And so, through the Levitical priesthood, Israel had a clear window into the reality of their true inheritance. They're not just to look at the gift, they're to be raised to behold the giver. It's not the blessing, it's the benefactor. It is the Lord himself that they want. It is the Lord himself that they need. The Lord is the one who is our portion forever, our inheritance, our delight in this world, in the world to come. Again, Leviticus, excuse me, Lamentations chapter 3. This is Jeremiah in very, very, very bleak days. The lights are out. It is stone cold in the spiritual winter of Israel. These are bleak days. And he writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the darkest days. Lamentations 3, verse 24. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Old Testament Jews didn't miss this point. They didn't read or think or hear what was happening with Joshua and miss it. They understood it, and we need to understand it. It's the Lord. The Lord has given us himself. The land points forward to a heavenly land given by our true Joshua. Joshua, God who saves, is Jesus, God who saves. Our true Joshua is the Lord Jesus who came as the captain of the host and who has conquered. He has conquered even the gates of hell. And he has opened to us the gates of heaven. And he says, it's yours. This, this heavenly inheritance is yours. It's all yours. But what is heaven without Christ? What makes heaven heavenly is the presence of God himself. It's the environment, the atmosphere in which we have the unbridled manifestation of the glory of God. It's the world living by sight in the new heavens and the new earth in the presence 
of Christ himself. It's having him. That is having heaven. To have Christ is to have heaven. And in having heaven, we have Jesus for eternity. He is the one who has come and led his people and triumphed victoriously over all of our enemies and secured for us in his own divine power all of his and our enemies, achieving and getting for us the totality of our inheritance, which he then bequeaths to us. Do you, do you get it? Do you hear and see what the passage is saying? Do you understand the implications for us? Those of us who are Christians, the blessing of gospel grace manifest in a passage that we would be tempted to otherwise not appreciate as we, ought, as we ought to. If you understand what we're saying, then you can sing with strength and joy. Psalm 16, verses 5 and 6. The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lines. This is speaking about the allotment, folks. This is the image of the land being given by allotment to his, his, the tribes. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. That's our song. God has put that song in our mouth, Christian. It's ours. He is our inheritance, and the lines indeed have fallen to us in pleasant places. Let's stand together for prayer. O oh Lord our God, we bless and thank you for the abundant gifts of grace given to us, undeserved, unmerited, unearned, bequeathed to us, given to us as an inheritance by grace. We thank you, O Lord, for your kind and gracious dealings with us. We pray that we do believe. Help thou our unbelief. Enable us, O Lord, to confidently take hope and comfort in what you will do in causing us to possess a heavenly land for all of eternity. And enable us in this season to continue to fight the good fight of faith in your strength and to your glory. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 41. We'll sing Psalm 41, verses 10 to 13. This is not one of the passages that we have quoted in that last portion of the sermon. But we'll sing Psalm 41, verses 10 to 13 to the tune St. Paul, number 124. In verse 11, by this I know that certainly I'm, I favored him by thee. Because my hateful enemy triumphs not over me. Verse 13, the Lord, the God of Israel, be blessed forever then, from age to age eternally. Amen, yea, amen. Let's sing verses 10 to 13.
together for the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Amen.